Hello everyone, uh, welcome to lecture two, where we're going to take a little bit of a closer look at relationships. So I will do a quick review of relationships and we'll go on to discuss a little bit more about Martin Buber and the thou relationship that we talked about in the uh, previous lecture. So firstly, um, welcome you all and let's do a quick review of relationships. So if you remember from last time, um, the kind of sociology that I'm arguing for is a sociology that takes relationships as central to understanding ourselves and society. So this is important in sociology itself, but particularly in marriage and family, where we're talking about two or more people and how we come to understand ourselves and whether these relationships like we talk about are between a, a spouse or between parent and child uh, or between ourselves and many other people these sorts of ways that we construct family and society and the ways that we experience and feel family and society is built on these sorts of relationships so i kind of want to do a quick review on the three main points so as I'm, as we've talked in the first lesson there's no um, essential piece that we're bringing with us this idea that we are um, care it's not just an individual, but it's, it's a pair. It's about the relationships. So first one, uh, what are we traveling with? So the infamous uh, briefcase, what are we bringing with us? So for instance, we might be doing things like um, identity, identity, um, our gender, our schooling, our religion, and of course, um, any other sorts of things that we bring with us, um, that we bring with us as an individual. So all of this is contained within ourselves. So if this is me. I have all these things that I'm bringing with me. So if we're asking the overall question, what are we traveling with? What are we bringing with us to relationships? We could think about all these different things, identity, gender, schooling, religion, any other sort of thing, even just uh, uh, interests. Interests. And the, the other thing, uh, because it, it, it's a, there's two people involved in this. So the second one is the, the who are we traveling with? Number two, who are we traveling with? And that could be uh, whoever we're in relation with. And we could if you think of that in the marriage and family sense as a spouse or a child or a parent. But broadly, it's anyone we could relate with in society, broadly speaking. So who can be anyone. And the who are we traveling with brings with it a similar sort of questions about what sorts of things they're carrying with them as well. And we broke that down a little bit in the first um, the first lecture or the first discussion that we each bring with us different um, identities, different gender, backgrounds, schooling, religions, etc. So these two components, if we mark this as number one and keep this as number two, these end up making a third component, the central part here, the relationship itself. The relationship itself between two people. So that gets to this number three, the what are we becoming? So in any relationship, there's at least three components. The first one, who we are, uh, what do we bring with us? Uh, two, who we're interacting with. Again, broadly speaking, it could be anyone we interact with. And finally, three, this dynamic thing that's constantly shifting and changing as we interact with each other. So the third part is the relationship itself. So I use a key term here that we're gonna jump into. This idea of becoming. So we're gonna break this down a little bit. Let me, next page. So again, this is relationships, again. So I'm gonna to get to this idea of uh, becoming. So we're gonna take a look at this term here. So. In philosophy, we think of being versus becoming. So this is just how we think of ourselves. So if this was myself 
and I had a little thought bubble here. This is how I think of myself. So being is maybe the more traditional sense. We'll go down this one first. So we go down being, down the next one. It implies this idea of I am. And if you've taken philosophy, or you probably have understand this intuitively just by seeing things from around the world, there's a philosopher named Descartes who his whole thing was, I think, therefore, I am. So we go into more detail in this if this was a philosophy class, but De Descartes' idea was, I think, therefore, I am. So this doesn't really involve anybody else. So it involves one person thinking on their own, and they're able to discover that who they truly are as an individual um, begins and ends within their own circle. So there's nothing necessarily coming in from the outside. The person is protected. There is a single I am. So the consequence of that, so if we write consequence, consequence is that things stay static, uh, things stay the same. Static is just another word for saying stay the same. Static or staying the same. So if you are self-contained and you don't have any influences from someone from the outside, they're blocked, and you're a single person, you're static and staying the same. Therefore, um, for example, if I say I am, um, I am smart, I am friendly, these things stay the same. They don't change over time. You are just smart. You are friendly. You're inherently those things, they don't change, right? So another form of understanding that broadens this a little bit and isn't necessarily true for all sociology, the one we're going to think about here as far as relationships go, more sociological understanding is this idea of becoming. So in becoming, if, I were, if this were me thinking again towards becoming, I still have the I am, but importantly, it's always taking place in context. So when we're thinking about context, it could be anything, like the things we've talked about before. It could be family dynamics. It could be school experiences. It could be religious experiences. Uh, any hardships that you've faced. All these things are going to affect this I am. So we no longer have uh, this original vision. So it looks something more like this over here, where we have an individual, the same one we've been drawing repeatedly, is sort of, rather than being on this end, where you have a self-contained individual, you're um, going to have a little bit more of this relation thing. The relationship with other people is actually going to change who you are. So. And maybe the context where you say um, this I am here, rather than just saying I am uh, friendly, maybe I'm friendly in a certain context. Maybe I had to learn to be friendly. Maybe I'm only friendly with uh, family members uh, or people that are close to me, so friends. But maybe I'm not friendly to strangers, for instance. So this idea then in becoming, this idea that your, your I am can change over time, it's dynamic and changeable, and of course, this time we have an official picture of a briefcase. But all these things you pack with you in your briefcase, all these experiences you've had, all the places you've been, everything you're packing with you is part of this dynamic context of you becoming. This idea then, we're not necessarily static, rather, we're something that's ever-changing. So, this I am is a I think of it as a spiral. It's constantly changing over time, rather than staying in one place. So the being stays in one place. Becoming is ever-changing and dynamic. So this is important in sociology. That's why I'm saying it's sociological. Because we have to think about the context that we're in, the people we surround ourselves in, and the experiences that we've had. So quite literally, this the, the trope of a parent saying, you know, don't hang out with those friends, they're a bad influence. In sociology, we take that very seriously because the people around us literally are making us who we are. So what does this mean then? We're talking about ethics. So this is just a small one. We're talking about Martin Buber again. So Martin Buber's idea then was a challenge to normative ethics. 
he argued then, if we change from this idea of being and rather that think of ourselves as something that is becoming, we're forced to be more ethical. Ethics is really what he's talking about. So this idea then that we're inherently more ethical because in this version, like we said before, you have to think of that relationship. So if we are literally this relationship here, if we were to cut out this other person, then we would not exist. So Brubu's whole idea is I and thou, we are inherently connected with each other and we cannot exist. We cannot have this being idea. I cannot be an I, I cannot be myself without other people in my lives. So to put it simply, um, without my parents, without my friends, without my family members, I literally would not be able to uh, become who I am today. So let's switch off and we'll look at a video here. So I will put a link to this in the beginning, which was the first six, six minutes of this. Um, but essentially this goes into detail of what Boober was talking about. Boober in 10 minutes. Thinkers in the existential tradition tend to have a reputation for being atheistic and individualistic. However, the Judaic theologian and philosopher Martin Buber would be a clear counterexample on both scores. By far, Buber's most famous work is his short, semi-poetic work I and Thou, which was originally published in 1923. I and Thou is an example of what is sometimes called dialogical or dialogal existentialism. The word dialogical is used to describe Buber's philosophy because much of it revolves around the way we address each other and the world more generally. We of course address each other in explicitly linguistic ways, but also in terms of the general presence we offer up to each other. Buber notes that this plays out in three main areas of life, our relation to nature, our relation to each other, and our relation to spiritual life. However, perhaps at first, it's easiest to think of how we speak to each other. For Buber, we speak to each other in one of two primary ways, which for Buber are denoted by two basic word pairs. One of these two word pairs is called I-it, while the other is called I-thou, or I-you, depending upon the translation. Let's take a minute to look at the I-it first. The I-it refers to a predominantly objectifying way of addressing another person addressing and treating someone as we would any other object, any other it. For instance, the I-it is the way that we typically treat each other in terms of practical necessity, manipulation, and means-ends instrumentality, in terms of using and experiencing, as Buber says, that is, in terms of either an externalized out-there way of addressing each other or an internalized in-here one. According to Buber, we speak the I-it with only part of our being. It's only a partially engaged way of addressing another person. Furthermore, Buber notes that the primary temporal modality of the I-it is the past. In other words, it's a way of treating each other governed mostly by things like what we know about the other person from our past experience, as well as our own past habitual patterns of interaction. One way of recognizing the I-it in our lives would be to think about how frequently we try to objectify each other in our everyday interactions. Isn't the unpleasant truth that a lot of the time our interactions with each other are basically about trying to get the other person to do what we want him or her to do? Basically about trying to manipulate the other person's behavior in light of what we know about that other person from our past experience, in much the same way that we manipulate objects. Most of the time, we aren't really acknowledging each other's deep humanity. The unpleasant truth is that most of the time, we're just trying to use each other to get what we want. In contrast, the I-thou has to do with what Buber calls relation or encounter. This has to do with first being completely present to another person rather than only partially engaged. It also has to do with addressing each other with a sense of mutuality and reciprocity, with recognizing and affirming the other person's full humanity with our full humanity. Here, the primary temporal modality is the spontaneously unfolding present rather than the past. The I-thou happens in the here and now rather than in the there and then. For Buber, the I-thou is important in our lives for many reasons. First, 
Experiencing the I Thou is one of the most precious parts of our human birthright. Furthermore, the I Thou is the locus of all genuine creative activity, all genuine spirituality, and all becoming and transcendence. Basically, for Buber, there is no such thing as growing as a human being all on our own, at least not in any deep way. All moments of genuine growing and becoming require a thou. In other words, they unfold between people rather than within or outside of people. Moments of transcendence basically occur in the unpredictable fluxion of genuine fully engaged relation with each other. For Buber, one of the main markers of whether we're in an I-it or I-thou mode is how we use the word I, which Buber regards as a kind of shibboleth or touchstone for the way we're addressing the world. On one hand, the I-it way of using the word I more or less maps onto the egoistic sense of self that we're often operating from. By way of contrast, Buber points to the very un-egoistic way Socrates, Goethe, and Jesus use the word I, basically as an expression of an I-thou relation. Of course, at this point, it's probably tempting for most of us to wonder about what we can do to have more I-thou moments in our lives. However, as Buber points out, I-thou moments do not arise out of willful activity alone. First, the opportunity to experience I-thou arises from grace, which is a kind of givenness that occasionally presents itself in our experience. But then, we also have to choose to enter into the I-thou experience willfully, by choice. In other words, the I-thou requires both will and grace. It beckons to us, but we must also choose to enter into it. As Buber puts it, the relation is election and electing, passive and active at once. So, perhaps the best thing we can do is to allow ourselves to become more sensitive to potential I-thou moments and to cultivate the courage to enter into them when they happen. ...of our social being. His main thesis here is that our increasingly industrial and technological way of life is heralding an unprecedented proliferation of the I-it at the expense of the I-thou. For instance, in our world, Knowledge has become mostly about debating and accumulating correct concepts, which have value only insofar as they further our master I-it project of conquering the world. Art and aesthetics have become mostly about evaluating constituent factors or simply about making money. Teaching has become mostly about imparting knowledge about how things are or how they ought to be, especially with respect to distributing grades, rather than about helping students learn to take a stand in relation. Similarly, Buber finds an unprecedented proliferation of the I-it in many other domains of our collective lives, in the economy, in politics, in the work world, etc. But, although our social and cultural lives are leading us ever more away from the thou and into the domain of it, he speculates on the possibility of what he calls the return, that is, the possibility of returning to the I-Thou is our primary way of addressing each other in the world. What is required for such a return to the I-Thou is, as Buber says, to call the incubus of the world of I-It by its true name. In other words, to call it exactly what it is, an imbalance on our relation to life that short circuits our chance to experience real relation, real transcendence, and real spirituality. According to Buber, the main impediment to effecting this sort of return is a kind of capriciousness that runs through our time. As he puts it, the capricious man does not believe in encounter. He does not know association. He only knows the feverish world out there and his desire to use it. To move more in the opposite direction, that is, toward the I-Thou, Buber claims that we need to sacrifice our little will, which is unfree and ruled by things and drives, to our great will that moves away from being determined to find destiny. In essence, our greatest enemy in this life is the small selves that we usually think we are. All in all, Buber's philosophy amounts to an incisive critique of some of the systemic imbalances and pathologies that run through our modern world. But he also offers up the paradigm of a powerful and compelling alternative to them. Perhaps in the final analysis, the central question of Buber's philosophy is whether in our modern technological way of life that so much draws us further and further into the world of it, we can nonetheless find within ourselves the sensitivity to detect the opportunity to enter into real relation with each other and then the courage to actively do so.
a question that plays out across our lives both individually and socially too. And that's Boober in 10 minutes. So going back into this, then, this whole idea then of what Boober was talking about and how it relates to our class is really looking at this Tao part and using this idea of understanding how this more respectful form of relation can affect how we individually experience the world. How we individually experience the social world and thinking of ways that we can make that better. So how can we improve our own relationships with each other, our own relationships with society to better experience the world? So he breaks it down into separate portions, nature, each other, and spiritual, and rethinking these relations that we have in all aspects of our life to go away from the I-it object relationship to the I-thou relational relationship. So finally, moving along into the last section then, our discussion questions for us to be thinking about this. So there's two discussion prompts here that I think would be important for us to think about as we move forward. So the first one, being versus becoming. So this idea, is this seems strange to you? Is this something that makes sense to you? This idea of being versus becoming. Do you feel that there's something essential or unchanging about you? Do you tend to feel more in this being sense? There's nothing wrong with this because this is often how we view the world. Is there something about you that doesn't ever change? Or a characteristic that you've had since birth? Or is this idea of becoming really make sense to you? This idea that we're constantly changing and when nothing ever really actually stays the same. Does this make more sense? Do you feel this when you go onto social media? Do you feel this when you have multiple uh, uh, social media accounts, when you're a different person perhaps in each context? Are we always becoming? Or is it somewhere in between? How do you feel about that? And the second one, if we're applying Martin Buber to life. So imagine that you can, this taking his idea seriously, that we can only be I can only be me, we can only be in relation with other people. That others in your life, uh, without others in your life, we wouldn't be who we are today. So what does this feel like? So who might be these people that you count as your most influential? So if you really think about people that have formed an essential part of you, who might these people be? Who might be the most influential people in your life? What places? have been the most influential? What has really been a core to your identity and becoming who you are today? Has it been school? Has it been going to church? Has it been a particular family member or a family gathering at, the, at a park? Has it been a, a place? Has it been a person? What are these most influential places and people that help make you who you are today?